In today's video, I buy my dream car and perform the world's most in-depth, OCD, totally ridiculous, and most expensive detail I have ever done. It was actually so ambitious that it ended kind of like this. But it wasn't all bad. Here's a quick overview of everything that went right. It's a thousand years, it's only one of me. It's a thousand years, it's only one of me. Get down, girl, go ahead, get down. Get down, girl, go ahead, get down. Get down, girl, go ahead, get down. But for you to understand the ending, you'll need to understand the beginning. So let's start with all the stuff that went right. After months of searching nationwide for the perfect RS5 Sportback, I finally came across. This is a 2021 RS5 Sportback Ascari Launch Edition, and there is only 100 Ascari Launch Editions that were ever made. They all had black interiors with white stitching, Alcantara steering wheels, which this one uh, needs a little bit of work. Now, the condition of the car is, you know, not bad and not good. It's just, it, it was good enough that I was confident I could fix everything that I could see visually that needed attention. Um, the one thing that bugged me was there was a giant rock chip on the hood, and they didn't really disclose that to me. They would have had to be blind to not have seen it. They just, they just didn't tell me about it and it didn't show up in pictures. That was frustrating, but we'll talk more about some of that stuff later. The biggest issues were the steering wheel and the leather seats needed a lot of uh, just, you know, like leather cleaning. Uh, but the steering wheel was my biggest concern. And I, I kind of knew about this before I bought the car and I was per fully prepared to replace the steering wheel if necessary. Again, we're gonna talk more about that a little later, but the beginning condition of the steering wheel was very, very rough. Now, all of these Ascari launch editions had Alcantara steering wheels and an Alcantara shifter. You'll also notice the car arrived pretty dirty. That's because I specifically told the Fort Washington Mercedes dealership, do not wash this car. Don't touch it. I don't care if it's dirty, ship it dirty. Like, let it be and I'll take care of it. This car got window tinted almost immediately. When, when the car came in and I showed you all the footage that previously happened, that was like one and a half hours before this window tint started because my window tint people just were able to fit me in. They, they started tinting it basically almost immediately after I got it. Window tint is really its own art form. The way they file the edges to make sure that it's like really precise and really close to the edge and the way you shrink the film on the outside. A lot of people think window tint goes on the outside of the glass and that's just not correct. They shrink it on the outside, then they roll it up and then roll it back out on the inside and your window tint's on the inside. In Illinois, where I live, the legal tint limit is 35%. And what you're watching get installed right now is definitely 35%. I mean, technically you can go darker, but... Sorry, I have no recommendation of that. No. I was chatting with my tint installer about doing windshield tint, but he said it wasn't exactly legal, but there was kind of loopholes. I think he probably recalls the conversation and can explain it to us. Mm. You do, you do recall it? No, I don't recall that at all. Random fun fact about me, I'm 100% Greek, and when a Greek person, like your dad for example, sees your brand new car, they always throw money in it, and you're not supposed to remove it for a couple weeks because it's good luck and you're supposed to leave the money in the car. The next step was to find out if the car needed to go to the body shop. We wanted to do things in the right order. You don't want to paint correct your car, ceramic coat it, PPF it, and then send it to a body shop. They're not exactly clean places. You risk overspray, and you can really undo all the nice work that you did very quickly. I determined that the hood should definitely be repainted because it has the dent in it, that big chip, and there were multiple chips spread around the hood as well. And then I saw the front bumper and it made me feel kind of like this. Basically the refinement after it was painted was very bad and resulted in really, really bad orange peel. A lot of people might actually think that looks like overspray or something, but it's actually not. Everything is painted, technically speaking, correctly on this bumper. The issue is that it was not wet sanded correctly. There were also a couple dust nibs that needed to be, you know, taken off. There's some chips and some other little things going on here, but none of this was bad enough that I was concerned about a 20,000 mile car. I expect one or two very tiny micro imperfections. From the mirror's 
back, the car is actually in pretty good condition. We obviously have swirl marks, but they're not horrible. I'd say that they're kind of in the medium to moderate of severity. It's safe to say this car was not run through a car wash that was automatic with brushes once a week, because if it had been, I think the paint would look much, much worse from a swirl mark perspective. Later in this video, we'll jump back into the exterior of the car and make everything perfect, including some really crazy wet sanding of that front bumper. While all this was going on, in the background, Forge Light was making us a fully bespoke set of T6 aluminum wheels. Forge Light offers nearly unlimited options for customization, and after scrutinizing this for weeks and weeks at a time, we decided on a brushed face with polished pocket and windows, which resulted in this amazing wheel that matched the silver accents on the Ascari Launch Edition perfectly. Forge Light delivered some of the most incredible customer service I've ever experienced in the automotive industry during the process of purchasing these wheels. And nearly every time I drive this car somewhere, I get a compliment on these wheels. I am so, so happy with this purchase. It was one of the only things that went right with this entire crazy project. Because I knew the car was going to a body shop and I knew it was going to be several weeks until that body shop could even take my car in to get the work done, I knew it was gonna be a while until I could properly dial in the outside of the car. I had about two months of work already scheduled through status detail like my actual business, and I was already doing all the work that I'm showing you at nighttime. This led for some really long days, like 16, 17 hour days where I would work on my car at night and then customer cars on the morning. But I wanted to start enjoying my car. I wanted to start driving it, and that meant that I had to, at the bare minimum, make the interior look pretty good because I didn't want to drive this used, dirty car. The steering wheel looked like it had 20,000 miles of daily wear and tear and oil and grease just cooking in there. I didn't even want to touch it, let alone sit in this thing. So the first thing I literally did detailing wise to the car was just really dial in the interior. The video I made on how to clean Alcantara, I am just, I'm putting that to work in this uh, section of the video here. You use Gian leather cleaner, you take a microfiber towel and then you spray gently into the steering wheel, but also into the microfiber towel and then you just work it really gently. There's there's very little force, very little you know friction happening here. You're just, you're very gentle and you're just kind of letting the cleaner do the work and you're basically pulling the dirt from the steering wheel into the microfiber towel. The trick to this method is you do it a lot, you, like multiple, multiple times. So you don't do this one time, one pass and it's beautiful. You do it like 20 times and again, that's because you're doing very little pressure. So if you're trying this step at home, don't try and you know get it all done in one step and really crank on the steering wheel and like really put tons of pressure and friction because that will damage the Alcantara 100%. In between doing the steps with the microfiber towel, you do wanna go in with a brush and kind of gently brush the material. Uh, the material being the Alcantara steering wheel because you kind of want to fluff it up. You want to dislodge any dirt that you can get dislodged and then you want to go back in with the towel and lift that dirt out of the steering wheel back into the towel. And again, just rinse and repeat. You're going to do this many, many times. You can see at the end of that process, we are looking really, really good. This is a 2021 with 20,000 miles on it and it looks brand new now. I'll show some quick before shots and then some quick after shots here. I mean, it is a night and day difference between how this looks. I wish you could feel the difference because it, it was literally brand new feeling and this system works so, so good. If you wanna try this on a car that you own or if you're a detailer and you wanna try this on customer cars, just all you need is microfiber towels and Gian leather cleaner. I do recommend a Gian leather brush, but you can use any leather brush you're comfortable with. And then in the end of this process, I do use Gian prep and I kind of use that to sanitize, but also because it has alcohol in it, it kind of evaporates and the steering wheel dries in a way that I like. It just dries clean and it smells nice and I know it's sanitary. All of those products can be purchased on statusdetailstore.com. The headliner on this car, and in general the car itself, didn't really smell bad, but it did smell like somebody else. Like it smelled like somebody else's car, which is typically what happens when you buy a used car. You can spray cleaners into the headliner and then I recommend you spray your towel in a similar fashion to the way we did the steering wheel and just get in there and scrub it out again you're going to do very very gentle we don't want a lot of friction here because we don't want to disturb or screw up the uh, material on the headliner headliners are really uh sensitive and you cannot oversaturate this or it'll ruin the adhesive that keeps the headliner up i did this process to all of the fabric interior to make it smell nice and then at the end of doing the cleaner steps i did use gian prep again because again i wanted to sanitize everything so it was a nice clean fresh interior for my new car i also wanted it to smell nice because in my opinion gian prep just smells amazing now you can see where this person used to rest their elbow on the driver door 
and you know it's kind of like a greasy spot like it's just different different color different shine you can tell the leather you know closer to the windshield controls there were much more matte and then this part was much more shiny this is just dead skin cells and like oil from our body and our arm that rubs off onto the car and again, I, want, I wanted to scrub this person out of my car. A quick before and after on this door shows just how amazing this comes out. Gian Leather Cleaner works on a lot of surfaces. You can use it on plastic and stuff like that just because it's convenient and it's in your hand. Um, but Gian Leather Cleaner does an amazing job pulling that kind of greasy, shiny stuff off your leather. And then at the end of that process, I always like to shoot a little bit of uh, Gian prep on there for all the reasons I've already discussed. So needless to say, all of the interior leather was cleaned. The driver's seat uh, was the worst. The passenger seat was actually in really, really good shape. And the back seat basically looked like no one had ever sat in it. This is something I don't typically do, but I wanted to do on my car because again, I just wanted to do this crazy deep clean like unlimited detail, no budget, open checkbook, just like I wanted to do everything. So typically we can just kind of vacuum the carpets and then maybe we'll spray a little bit of cleaner on it and that will make the carpet look pretty nice. Once I'm done doing what I would typically do to a carpet, you can see the carpet looks good. It just looks like a used carpet. I think we would all agree this doesn't look brand new. It doesn't necessarily look quote unquote dirty, but it does look used. So the next step to really go the extra mile here is to do a carpet extraction. But this carpet extractor, I think is only like a hundred bucks or it might be like $150. And uh, I'm pretty sure you can buy something like this, if not this exact one on Amazon. And you're gonna see this thing does a really, really nice job. I basically just put normal laundry detergent, which was tied in my carpet extractor. And then I just went to town. I put hot water in the extractor as well. I had to pre-fill it with water from my tap. So I just put really, really hot tap water in. Now this literally couldn't be any simpler. A lot of the stuff I do sometimes looks like some kind of witchcraft that you guys can't do at home. All you have to do is spray everything down with the, the solution, which you have a little trigger on the carpet extractor. It mixes it, shoots it out. And then there's a brush built into the carpet extractor and you just scrub like crazy and that kind of loosens all the dirt and then you go back in and you suck it all back out. And you can see through the process of me doing this even only one or two times, look how amazing this carpet looks now. It looks so much more new than it did before. It looks much more black. You can see the RS writing and the red part of the carpet there, the stitching. It's like been completely brought back to life. It took all of the dirt out of that. This is the passenger front mat and again, you can see this looks brand new already. And I've done this a couple times, I've gone over it, and you can just see this mat looks absolutely amazing. And this was not possible unless you did carpet extraction. And this just shows you in this video, you don't need a crazy expensive carpet extractor. You just need something that will spray basically laundry detergent onto your carpet. Then you need to use a brush to agitate it. And then you need to suck it back out, which would technically mean guys at home, if you want to try this, you just need a spray bottle with laundry detergent in it. Then you need to brush it really good. And then you could use a shop vac, like a wet dry shop vac and suck all the moisture back out. The only reason I didn't do it that way is because I didn't want to really destroy my shop vac with really nasty water inside of it. So I keep my shop vac dry and then I use a carpet extractor for wet stuff. Now the theme of this video is kind of uh, going the extra mile and going a little crazy. So obviously we vacuumed out the actual mats that are in the car. Again, I'm not putting a lot of water in here because underneath this carpet that's in the bottom of the car, there is a lot of like thick foam which kind of does sound deadening and also just makes it kind of like soft. But if you get too much water in there, it's gonna seep too far down into the foam and you risk majorly getting mold in the car and you don't want mold in your car for so many different reasons. So when you're doing this part of the carpet, if you're doing this at home, do very, very light on the water and then vacuum like as much as you humanly possibly can and then go back with a microfiber towel and then wipe some of the moisture out with a dry microfiber towel because you want the carpets here to be very, very dry. The carpets that I did outside the car, I actually put those outside and let them dry and then I left them in the garage for a while and let them dry for like a day and a half or two days. But once everything was said and done, the interior looked completely brand new and the carpets that were removable also looked completely brand new, especially the two back carpets and the front passenger one, but also the carpet for the driver's side looked amazing minus that little spot where your heel goes. And everyone's favorite part about a carpet extraction video is the tank with all the fluid in it. So that's what came out of the carpets guys, really unbelievable. So once you vacuum a carpet and you think it's clean, that's all the stuff that's still on your carpet. We had some old stickers on the windshield that needed to be removed and typically these come off really, really easily, but, but for some reason these were really complicated 
complicated to remove. It must be whatever kind of goofy sticker they use in Pennsylvania. But you basically just use a razor blade on a holder like the one I'm using and you scrape it off slowly. And then once you get the majority of the sticker off, you go back with something like Gian Prep, which has alcohol in it, and that will dissolve the rest of the glue. This is a very slow process. You can use things like Goo Gone or even Gian Tar, but those have very, very strong smells and I don't want that smell inside my car. So I use Gian Prep and do it slowly. Another interesting thing that people might not realize is that typically the things in your cup holder and the trays in your car that have spots for storage like your phone almost always have a little tab on them and if you pull up on that tab the whole piece comes out and it's just so you can clean everything really really easily because you don't want to necessarily clean these inside the car I'd much rather take them out you'll also notice when I'm putting these back in that the bottom part of these cup holders and stuff like that have kind of holes in them so if you oversaturate these when you're cleaning them in the car you can end up having the liquid leak through and drain through those holes and you don't really want that to happen you, you want to clean them outside and then put them back in the car completely dry now the piano black trim which is basically the only piano black trim in almost the entire car is on the center console here and it was pretty scratched up now piano black gets scratched up about three miles off the dealership lot like that's just what happens with it piano black trim is probably my least favorite thing to have in a car i did some research online and i did find that i could get this piece um, done in carbon fiber or in Alcantara. At a later date, I will swap that out. I'm not sure when I will do that, um, but I did a very, very light polish by hand on this. You need to be very careful doing this with an actual rotary polisher because you can just kind of cause some problems and some issues. And I definitely did not get this panel perfect by doing this, but I did make it slightly better and just make it a little more shiny, but it's completely trashed and still has lots of problems in it. So I will switch this out to either Alcantara or carbon fiber in the future. And in general, if anyone is buying a car or has a car currently with piano black trim on it, just know that it will get destroyed and there's very little you can do about it. You can put PPF on stuff like this, but you'll have pretty serious seams all over the place, which is better or worse. I don't know, it's for you to determine. This is another thing that I've done on camera in a video for the Lamborghini Countach, but it's a rare sight that you see me do this and it's because it's a very expensive, very time consuming thing to do. Now this is the Leather Q or Leather Eek, people call it different things, but it's a leather oil system. And this company has been in business for a very, very long time and they specialize in leather care products. It's the only thing they make. It breathes life back into leather like nothing I have ever seen before. And it's probably because this company has specialized in leather for like over a hundred years. It's a very weird application. So you don't typically wear gloves because you kind of want the heat that's in your body and your hands to go into the product and into the leather and you just put a bunch of it on your hand and then you rub it into the leather. And then you would think you would remove it because it's making the leather greasy. And we always say we don't want the leather to be greasy or oily or shiny. And that's exactly what this product does. But what this product does is when this oil sits on the leather for a prolonged period of time, like many hours, or even you can leave it on for a day or two if you want to, it sinks deep into the leather and it hydrates it, which softens it. And it also pushes so far into the leather that it actually like pushes dirt out. So the leather has nothing else to do but absorb the oil. And then in the process of it absorbing the oil, it actually pushes dirt back out, which is like crazy witchcraft stuff, but I, I'm telling you it works. Guys, the smell of this product is unbelievable. It makes the car smell like brand new, fresh, leather that just got like installed into the car. It's one of my favorite things to do to a brand new car that's new to me in this case when you buy a used car because it just restores this this newness to the leather. It feels new, it smells new. There's no detailing product that I really use in my like lineup that works like this. It's, it's this really insane system that seems backwards and shouldn't work because you're dumping oil on the leather but when, when you're done it just it looks amazing. Now when I'm done doing this system, this might seem counterintuitive, but when I'm done doing this system, I actually go back and I do a really fast light cleaning with Gian Leather Cleaner and a brush. This is kind of what the system would be like when you're doing maintenance like every couple months, because you can see I am doing very little pressure and I'm doing this very, very quickly because I don't want to really like erase a lot of the work I just did, but I do want to remove any um, like slipperiness or oiliness that might be left in the leather because when you're, when you're done doing this and if you've done it correctly, you will be left with like one to 5% of like a weird oiliness that could be on the seat. And I want that to be removed. I want the seat to be completely dry, completely matte and have no oily stuff left over. So I will do Gion leather and then after this, I'll actually follow with Gion Prep because again, Gion Prep is great at neutralizing oils, like polishing oil, for example. And when you're done doing that, you get a 100% OEM brand new looking seat 
and you are not by any means, if you're doing it correctly, undoing the work you just did. The leather is still very soft. It's very supple feeling. It's going to look amazing like brand new OEM leather. And I swear it makes the leather more like rich and deep looking because sometimes your leather can start to look kind of gray. I think this makes it like more black. That's just my opinion. Um, but I'm telling you, this stuff is total detail in witchcraft. It's one of the more interesting products and systems that I do to a car because it's just, uh, it's very unique in the way it works. And I don't show it very often because it's a very, very messy thing to do because when you get that oil on your hands, it's very difficult to use or touch the camera. Um, so this is one of those things I don't do very often. It is very expensive, but again, when you're doing an open checkbook, unlisted, crazy detail, this is definitely part of it. And that basically wraps up the interior section of the detail. Now, it's hard to show this on camera, but I put so much work into the inside of this car that I think we must have literally done this car for maybe a week and a half to over two weeks of just interior work. I'm doing normal detailing while this is happening. So I was doing like 911 turbos and like a bunch of different Porsches during the daytime. And then for like three to four hours or five hours after that, like starting at 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. or five to like, you know, midnight or something, I was doing my car. And at this point, I had only driven my car one time to McDonald's because it had just come off the delivery truck and I wanted to drive it because I literally bought this crazy expensive car and I hadn't even driven it yet. The exterior could wait if it needed to. The car was going to be parked outside a lot. So it was kind of whatever if it was dirty. But obviously I wanted to keep making progress and, and really, you know, getting into my exterior detail as soon as possible. But let's just appreciate how good the interior looks after half a month of work went into it. I would argue, and I think many of you will agree with me, the leather and the overall interior and just the way it looks I could fool almost any of you especially in videos and pictures that this car looks like it has under 500 miles on it and that it's essentially brand new and that's what you can do to a car like this if you have the right skills and the right tools or even the right guide like if you're at home following this and uh, you know sometimes you can buy a used car like this and save a ton of money and then even at 20,000 miles, do some detailing stuff to it, literally make it look like it has 500 or less miles on it. And you just reap, you know, the benefits of saving all of that money that you didn't have to buy a brand new car. This car is over $100,000 brand new. And I paid about $80,000 even, actually, it was actually exactly $80,000 even. So I paid 20,000 under MSRP and got a car on the interior wise to look exactly like a car that was worth $20,000 more. I would say that's pretty good value with what if you wanted to try at home isn't a lot of products probably under 300 maybe $500 if you include the carpet extractor. That's pretty good value. Whenever I buy a new car I always buy a new cabin filter. These are easily accessible they're not very expensive it was like 25 bucks there's like an activated charcoal side and then that's the other side. And I can't even show you where this goes because it's so ridiculous. It's like way the hell back here. If I leave this camera on for you, this thing goes like, so it kind of curves and it goes in there, but getting into this footwell area and doing this is very, very difficult. All right, here we go. Get in there, baby. Oh, come on, what the f Ha ha! Holy crap. Next up was the paint correction step. And this is one of my favorite things to do during the detailing process because Status Detail actually started as a paint correction and ceramic coating company, but the main focus in the early days was paint correction. And I, I put just a crazy amount of time and research and development into my paint correction process. I like to change certain things. I do a couple things different than other people. And uh, I've developed this process that I just, I love. It's a passion driven thing. It's very relaxing and peaceful to me. And uh, it's just hands down probably my, one of my favorite steps of the detailing process. Now my RS5 has a pretty good amount of swirl marks throughout the entire thing. I deem all of these relatively normal for a car that's got 20,000 miles and is a few years old. Now when I compare my car to a, for example, brand new Porsche with 50 miles on it, I've done lots of those Porsches that are brand new and have way worse problems than my car. So my car was actually in pretty good shape considering it is a used car with 20,000 miles. You have to remember this car has been washed many, many times over the last couple years and through those miles. And the car does seem to have been, you know, washed relatively properly over that time frame. Now, yes, it does have swirl marks, but it could be so much worse from where we're at. So whatever was going on, it does actually look like this car was cared for, you know, moderately well, I would say. All right, so I wanted to show you something really quick. 
So most cars that are gonna have hard paint, you're gonna use Ultra Cut with a uh, blue HDO pad. Now most cars that have soft to medium paint, you're gonna use Reflect with an HDO pad. Now this stuff is from, this is a Rupes Uno One Pure. This is a jeweling polish or a finishing polish, and this is an HDO black pad. So this doesn't necessarily work on any car's paint. This is just a follow-up. So after you do this, you would do this, or after you do this, you would most of the time follow with this and then finish with this. This does not really do anything for swirl marks. This jewels the paint so you get this incredible liquid, deep, wet gloss. That's what a jeweling polish does. To recap, bad defects, you're gonna use Ultra Cut with a dense blue pad, medium defects, reflect with a medium dense pad, and then after you've used those and you wanna go for the extra 1%, you use a finishing polish or a jeweling polish with an incredibly soft pad. This is a difficult thing to explain, but when I'm doing paint correction, because I have so much time behind a polisher and I literally have researched and done this for so long, and I've honestly probably done it to a slightly unhealthy level, which is typically how I do things in the detailing world because I'm just very meticulous um, and I, it's hard for me to relax and rest until I like sort something out in my brain. So if I am researching a specific kind of compound until I learn like everything about it, I can't really take a break. It's difficult for me to separate that. Um, and when you do that for years, you learn a, a ton about paint correction and, and how this all works. So I've gotten to the point now where when I actually do paint correction, it's like this zen state, like a zen mode where I'm just like in the zone and I, I can almost do it with my eyes closed. It's extremely relaxing for me. It's almost like meditation. And uh, it's just simply one of my favorite parts of, you know, the process of cleaning a car now. You know, once you get into a rhythm and you know exactly how the paint on the particular car you are working on will, will behave to the process that you are doing, because almost every car will require a unique, new, slightly different process to perfect the paint. Once you like figure that out after a couple panels, you really, for me, like I really just can zone out and like autopilot the whole car. And it's, it's an interesting thing because I don't, I don't know if anyone else feels that way about it. If you do, comment below. I wonder um, if any other detailers watching this can kind of relate to like this weird euphoric uh, state where like when you're just like zoned in, you're like locked in and you're just able to do a car in this uh, kind of autopilot mode. Most of you have probably been waiting for me to dig into this part, the unbelievable bad orange peel in this bumper. So this was basically repainted at some point and it just wasn't wet sanded all the way or maybe at all um, on the lower section of the bumper. So some of the parts of the bumper were clearly wet sanded, they look pretty good, but the lower sections do look really, really bad. So there's this tremendous or orange peel and it was never refined at the body shop. So I'm going to do that refinement now. Um, but for the time being, I use a range of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, and usually 3,000. Uh, depending on the job I'm doing, I don't use all of those and I won't do, use all of those in the same order. Sometimes I'll do 2,000 to test it out. I won't like that. I'll drop down to 1,500. I'll seem like that's pretty good. Then I'll go back to 3,000, try and remove that, and then I'll go to paint correction. It's a fluid system. You have to kind of feel it out on every car and see what you need to do, but you're always trying to chase the least aggressive method so you can leave the most amount of clear coat on the car. So I'm sanding to improve this orange peel, but not to fully remove it. If I fully remove it, I'm gonna risk burning through the clear coat and completely ruining the bumper and that's not really what I'm looking to do. In my case, the one insurance I had was the car was probably going to a body shop no matter what, because we had some other things we wanted to take care of. I'm sanding with a block, and I really should buy some blocks from KXK Dynamics, and I probably will be doing that soon, but for the time being, I'm using like a makeshift block, and the block basically helps give you even pressure, so you're not uh, digging in with your fingertips. You gotta be careful when you're using your fingertips. I use my fingertips on paper later in this video, you can absolutely do that and be successful, but it's difficult because a block will just be better overall and give you a better finish. But that doesn't mean that sanding by hand is wrong. But if you ask the average person who's very, very good at sanding what their opinion was, they would tell you to use a block. The other thing you'll notice in this video is you have to be really careful around like the edges. So there's like a hard body line um, in the, on, the, on the side of the bumper here. And if you're not careful, if you're sanding over that too hard, you're gonna burn through it really, really quickly. So you have to be very, very careful on any like body lines or body seams because the paint will always be thinner in those places. One of the many reasons we sand to improve and not remove is because you can see after I sand all that clear coat off and you see that white slurry kind of happen, that's like clear coat mixing with water and coming off the car. 
we have to then remove all of the sanding mark because that huge dull spot is obviously not acceptable. So then you have to go back and compound the car. Now, you know, we hear a lot about people burning through paint when they're compounding because that also removes a lot of clear coat. So you have to leave enough of the defect potentially in the panel after sanding because I still have to remove all of that clear coat afterwards with compound to get back to shiny glossy paint. So if you remove the full defect by the time you've removed all of the sanding mark with compound, that might be when you actually burn through the clear coat. And it's a very difficult thing to gauge, so you have to go on the side of caution every time when you're sanding. Once we are done doing this step, you can see that we've basically removed all of that orange peel. The reality is that the orange peel on this part of the car is probably better than most of the car now. It's actually probably more clear and has better clarity, but I actually did my best to try and match the orange peel that was on the other parts of the bumper and on the fender because I wanted it to kind of match. If I had sanded, you know, really, really far, then I would have ended up having a literal mirror finish and like no orange peel and that would look bizarre next to other spots. My assumption is that the body shop or maybe dealership that ended up doing this or commissioning this to a body shop um, didn't get paid a lot of money, so they just rushed through this really quickly, and honestly, they did a halfway decent job painting the bumper. There were dust nibs and some problems here and there. I actually feel like I kind of lucked out because this could have been a way worse situation, especially because I bought the car sight unseen from another state and literally just never saw the car in person. It's interesting to show that perfect paint that has been wet sanded and paint corrected and is smooth and has very little orange peel, like there's no wax, no protection. It's obviously not perfectly water beating or anything, but when paint is really clean and really perfect, it does actually do that. So if we put wax on this right now, it would be unbelievable. This is another reason why you want to do paint correction. When you paint correct your car, this is what it's gonna look like. And then when you put protection on top of that, you're putting ceramic coating on top of a really smooth, really flat surface that's gonna bond better. Once the paint correction step was finished, you can see we have really beautiful paint. There are no swirl marks, no issues. And for a car with 20,000 miles outside of the rock chip issues, the paint looks terrific. Getting the elusive dripping wet gloss can be very difficult to do, but once you've done the research and understand the steps and understand what products to use and what process to use, it actually becomes very, very easy. The one downside is to get really crazy gloss and to really push to that last stage takes a lot of time. So just getting a car from like the 50 to 70% gloss to like 80 to 90, most people can usually pull that off. Now going from 90 to 95, that gets pretty hard. Going from 95 to 100, that gets really, really hard and it gets really, really time consuming. So the, the more you wanna refine those last couple points out to get to 100%, those can take longer than the whole steps that you did before that to correct like 95% of the car. And normal insane people would stop at this point after polishing the entire car for a few days, but uh, I was a little crazy and I couldn't stop and the car wasn't done and I wanted it to be perfect. So I ended up polishing all the door jams because when you're going for the maximum unlisted crazy detail, you have to polish all the paint on the car and that means the door jams have to be perfect. Next up, I wanted to get into my paint protection film installation because I was really getting close to finishing the car and being able to fully enjoy it. But before I could do that, I had just finished my paint correction steps and you can see there was dust everywhere. One speck of dust ruins a piece of paint protection film when you're installing it, and that is a really hard thing to swallow as a paint protection film installer who's very meticulous. So the best way to combat this is to pull the car outside and wash it really, really carefully, and to really rinse it carefully. If you spend a lot of time rinsing all the jams and all these little specks and all these little spots that I'm showing on camera right now, you have a much higher chance of just rinsing all the dirt out, all the dust out, all the compound dust out, and that will mean when you're doing your paint protection film install, and you're spraying water to get like everything lubricated so you can put the film on, that all you will have is water on the panel versus water that will sometimes rinse dirt or compound dust out of a jam and then that ends up in the panel. When you put the PPF on, that means of course you'll have a piece of dust in the panel and that is not what we like to see. At this stage, my car actually wasn't that dirty in the terms of needing a, like an actual wash with contact, but I did need to rinse all that dust off. So I'm using Gion foam here, which could also be uh, Car Pro Lift, they're interchangeable. And I'm using these foams because I want them to like emulsify all the dirt and the compound stuff and kind of slowly pull it off the car and pull it out of the jams and nooks and crannies. So when I rinse it, they're extra, extra clean. Um, now, no matter what you do, whether you're using a soap or not using a soap, the best thing you can do in this situation is just to rinse the jams the best you can, which will literally mean when you're doing like the jam between the fender and the door, for example, just put the pressure washer like 
five inches away from that and just hold it there for like 10 seconds so you can blow everything out of that. That's very, very important. And I've gotten really good at this and I've gotten a pretty good process, I think, for this because the last two cars that I've paint, done paint protection film on recently in the month of uh, December and November, we've had really, really, really awesome installs in with no dust, no issues. And it's been a wonderful experience of installing because it goes way smoother when there's no dust. So I think I finally figured that out. And the secret really is just stand there way longer than you think you need to and just blast water into the seams and let all the crud come out. My goal on this car was to do full body paint protection film because obviously we were doing everything to the max. So I started on little panels whenever I could get my time to do them and I started with doing the fenders and the front bumper because I wanted to get paint protection film on those because if I did drive the car at least the very front of the car would be protected which is the most likely areas to get paint chips and issues. My fenders and my bumper at this stage in the detail were basically perfect so there was no need to not paint protect them. Uh, I know some of you are thinking, you know, I thought you said you wanted to go to the body shop first and we'll talk more about that in a second but bottom line is I ended up doing the paint protection film before going to the body shop that will make more sense in a minute. The S tech or some people call it stec film that I use is a little different from other people's films and not everyone's going to notice this but the average status detail customer will notice this because we are all very very meticulous and that's kind of why most of our customers end up coming here is because they know I'm very meticulous and that's kind of how the relationship starts. And they know that if they've watched my other videos that this film is more optically clear than basically every film on the market. I have a lot of videos on this. I have one specific video comparing Expel to this film and it's just more clear. So when we were talking about orange peel before on the front bumper, other films have exponentially more orange peel in them, which makes the car look like it's been painted poorly. So if you put that other film over a car, like for example, the bumper that I fixed all that orange peel on, that film will actually add orange peel back into the panel. That's a huge deal to me, especially when I've taken so much pride and joy into making the paint look perfect. Aztec adds virtually no orange peel, and on some cars, I swear, it actually makes the orange peel look better. It actually smooths it out and makes it appear more clear. Aztec film is also very hydrophobic because it actually has like a built-in ceramic coating in the film. I would never rely solely on that, but it's nice that it's built in. I always layer my ceramic system on top of that, and then that together makes this amazing unified protection system. It makes this crazy hydrophobic surface that makes it so easy to clean and it makes it stay cleaner longer. And I love that the film has that feature built into it. You can see I pulled the door handles off and some trim on the door just to make sure I got the cleanest installation possible. I want that film tucked so it's invisible. And I really go out of my way on all my installations, especially obviously on my own car, to install film to a level where you cannot see that film. I recently did a car for a gentleman in Oklahoma because most of our customers are out of state at this point. And he brought the car to his dealership afterwards to show them the installation. And he told me that even most of the people in the dealership, including like the sales managers and stuff, like that couldn't actually find the film on the car because we literally tucked it in a way that you would not see the edge like it was invisible because it was behind the, the door when the door was shut or behind pieces of trim that we removed and uh, that's the goal you, you want to show the car to people and for them to literally not be able to find the film and that means it was a perfect install Ultimately, I was able to get the front bumper, two fenders, and my back two doors done. I did the back two doors uh, early on because I did notice that like in a rocker panel situation, uh, there were lots of chips building up in that area because of the way the car is designed. The lower back part of the doors was taking some damage over those first 20,000 miles and I wanted to make sure that they didn't take any more during my ownership. I completely came to a screeching halt on this detail and just literally could not continue anymore. And that was when we reached the, the conclusion that this was going to be the disaster detail video because I'll explain to you what happened in the next segment. So you're probably wondering, how did we end up here? The car never got finished the way it was intended to get finished. The entire purpose of this um, video and kind of the purpose I bought this car was to make a video called the unlisted detail. And the point of that was that it was never gonna be listed on my website. The only way you could ask for an unlisted detail was to watch this video and go, wow, that's amazing. Call me and say, I watched your video. I want what you did in that video. And the unlisted detail was gonna be like the open checkbook, no compromise, ridiculous details. And what happened was it was basically too over the top for me to accomplish while doing other cars. So I tried to do it constantly at the end of my workday. So after four or 5 p.m., I would work from then till midnight and do my car. And after you do so many, 
many like 18 hour days for 30 days in a row, you just experience burnout. And that's kind of what happened to me. And there were so many problems. We, you know, we needed to get to the body shop to do the body shop stuff, but the body shop was booked out. And then we were gonna do dry ice stuff. Like I was in dry ice the entire car, but we were gonna show the full dry ice process. We were gonna show like literally from start to finish the entire painting process with behind the scenes stuff, literally them spraying the, like the, the paint and the clear on. And it would have been really cool. The video would have been probably one of the coolest videos ever of like taking a 20,000 mile car and making it look better than brand new. Plus everything you saw in this video, plus full body paint protection film. Plus I was gonna film all the modifications. So like the wheels was just part of it. We were gonna do a tune and intake. I was gonna do um, like some other carbon fiber stuff on the car. I was gonna do, uh, I was gonna swap out that interior uh, piano black stuff for, uh, probably Alcantara or just a carbon fiber piece. Like there was so many elements to this video. It was gonna be an insane transformation packed into probably an hour long video. Be careful mixing, you know, work and your hobby, especially if your work and your hobby are the same thing like it is for me. My videos slowed down because I was burned out and what I would normally do is work in here and then when I'm done at the end of the day, spend an hour or two editing and then that's how I would make videos come out pretty often. But when I kind of burned out, I needed to like step away from work. So when I was in here and I would finish my work for the day and all the cars we did were perfect during that time frame, I just needed to rest afterwards. So I would read a book, play video games, watch a movie, hang out with family, whatever. I would do something that had nothing to do with cars and that slowly kind of like unwound the burnout feeling. The other reason, by the way, that I wasn't posting videos very often recently is because I'm extremely busy. Like right now I have a Ferrari over there and I've got a Ferrari here and they're both from Miami. Um, and we've just, we're constantly booked, you know, two months out. We're extremely busy doing these massive details all the time for you guys. And it's time consuming. So I'm in here a lot and because I'm in here a lot, I can't be in the office editing. So I'm always filming and there's lots of videos coming and those videos are all awesome. But that is the main reason. Those two things together were why my video production slowed down massively. Some of the videos that are coming are amazing. The 458 Speciale video over here is gonna be amazing. The video on this car is probably the worst paint protection film job I've ever seen in my life. And I ripped it all off and I redid the whole car and that story is gonna be super cool. And uh, the sport, I did two sport classics that are amazing stories and there's a GT3 RS that's a cool story. And there's, there's just so many cool stuff, uh, cool videos coming. So uh, thank you for being part of the brand. Thank you for helping uh, me get to a successful point of the business through YouTube because you guys are liking, you're commenting, or even if you're disliking, that even helps the video. And all of that success was you know, how I grew the business and was able to buy the RS5 that's sitting outside right now in the snow because I have these two cars in here. And it's you guys, you know, it's you guys helping the brand massively through YouTube. So thank you so much. If you wanna see me you know, buy a Porsche or buy a Ferrari like this one, continue to watch the videos and continue to like and comment and all that stuff. And uh, I'll see you in a new video real soon. Thanks for watching.